call the meeting to order. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is the uh, August 4th uh, Vermont State College System Board of Trustees meeting. Um, I'm going to start out with the housekeeping note that there's, uh, there is a link to sign up to provide a public comment. It's available on the agenda published on the VSC website and it's posted in the chat. And we will get to that later on. Uh, there's a proposed amend alterations to the agenda. We're going to move up the additional business and public comment to before the board training session. So people who want to make a comment can, can do so earlier before we get into the, the other piece. And um, we have a proposed revision of the VSC policy 301 policy on determinant of in-state residency for tuition purposes to the agenda under additional business. It's in response to a recent change in federal law regarding in-state tuition for veterans. So starting with that, I will just call everybody to order. Welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, we start with a resolution this morning, excuse me, this afternoon. Uh, honoring President Elaine Collins, I will read the resolution. It is a resolution of 2021-019, honoring the exceptional service of Dr. Elaine Collins. Whereas for six years, Elaine Collins has led transformational change at Johnson State College, Linden State College and Northern Vermont University, bringing her strong values to work every day. And whereas Elaine Collins has successfully led the unification of Johnson State College and Linden State College, which has become a national model resulting in routine consultation on other active and proposed mergers. And whereas Elaine Collins has provided tireless leadership to ensure access to higher education in our rural communities. And whereas Elaine Collins has served as a NECI commissioner commencing in the fall of 2019, which provided her with an experience and perspective that has served NVU and the VSC well. And whereas Elaine Collins has overseen the implementation of the first NVU strategic plan with 85% of the planning goals complete or in progress. And whereas Elaine Collins has during her tenure stewarded donors resulting in a $3.5 million private gift, the largest gift received in the system and two USDA grants to support teleconferencing equipment linking NVU programming to 60 sites across Vermont. And whereas Elaine Collins values the transformative student experience and has during her tenure received a $1.8 million Title III Strengthening Institution Grant focusing on student success, founded the inaugural women's triathlon team at Johnson, provided leadership in the NAC and served as the NAC president. And with a strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, she initiated the first DEI task force on the Johnson campus. And whereas Elaine Collins has a strong commitment to advance innovative professional and liberal arts education, founding the Center for Teaching and Learning, <clears throat> excuse me, successfully secured COPLAC designation for the Johnson campus prior to unification and established several new degree programs, including the Innovative and Interdisciplinary Performance Arts and Technology Program, Data Science, Digital Communications, and a Master's in Leadership as well as acquiring the master's in mental health counseling program that is established in Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Wisconsin, and Alaska. And additionally, expanding the NVU online division. And whereas Elaine Collins has provided exceptional community leadership and advanced the economic vi viability of NVU by developing the Due North co-working space in Lindenville and securing the Forestry Accelerator Grant, developed a partnership with the Vermont Woodworking School and developed a partnership with VTC to provide Northern tier communities greater access to nursing programming. And whereas Elaine Collins has provided exceptional leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure a safe learning and working campus environment. And therefore be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Vermont State College System values and celebrates the contribution of Elaine Collins to Northern Vermont University, to the system, and to the state of Vermont and wishes her the very best, dated this day, fourth day of August, 2021. Do I have a motion on that? So moved by Mary, a second? Is that Karen? Okay. Lots of motions and seconds. Elaine, are there any? Elaine, we just, we hope that this is exa an example of our appreciation. It, 
may Thank not you. be much, but I'll tell you, we certainly feel indebted to you for six years of incredible work. Is there any other further discussion or questions on this resolution? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any, any dissent? Seeing none, Elaine, congratulations. I hope you are looking forward to a really good quality retirement and we're gonna miss you. And the communities are going to miss you. Anyone else have anything else to say? I know that there was some folks invited to um, to share thoughts as well. And I, I think Elaine wants to say something. So go ahead, Elaine. Thank you. I'd like to thank the board for this recognition uh, and also for your trust throughout the six years uh, that I've been here. I remember when Church left, he talked about by the numbers. So I just figured up, I, I added up some numbers. This is actually my 38th year full-time employment as an educator, 25 years in higher education administration at the level of Dean, Vice President, and the last six years as president. I'm grateful to all members of the Johnson and Linden communities for your continued commitment, your grit, and your determination. You've shown me time and time again that together we can make the impossible possible. Suzanne and I will be forever changed by the JSC, LSC, and MBU spirit. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve beside you, and we wish you the very best as you move forward with this transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Anyone else? Don't be shy. I'd love to say something. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Tyrone. Six years ago, during her tour of Johnson State College as a finalist uh, to succeed outgoing President Barbara Murphy, I asked Elaine Collins if she thought public higher education was a matter of social justice, to which this first generation college graduate responded with gentle ferocity that I have come to know well, you bet I do. As chair of the JSC faculty assembly and then of NVU Johnson's assembly, um, until now I have stepped down from that position, I have had the honor of working closely with this extraordinary leader in person through times none of us had hoped to see or even imagine. I have been with her at several board of trustees meetings, uh, retreats at Lake Maury as she fought tenaciously for the survival of NVU, NVU as a two campus university and therefore for real and meaningful access to higher education for the Northern tier of Vermont for in a word, social justice. I can only hope that the emergent university to which we all now have a stake will preserve that vision. She has walked the walk, talked the talk, always with unadorned directness and passion. She is who she is, thank God, and the VSCS and the state are better off for it. I remain in awe of the grit, grace, and gumption with which she has navigated this time of rough and unpredictable transformation. Godspeed, Elaine. We owe you a lot. Thank you. Tyrone, I'm going to start here at the top with Nolan Adkins. Well, I got to say, it's hard to follow my very articulate colleague, Tyrone Shaw, <laughs> but uh, here we are. So, Elaine, uh, I'll speak for myself, but I know I speak on behalf of, of your executive team, both members that are currently with you or those that have been with you over the past few years. But, you know, I would just say that it's it's been an extraordinary honor and privilege to work with you and particularly to learn from you over the past few years. Um, we are extraordinarily grateful for your tireless, tireless commitment to our students, to our students, our community, our institution. Um, it is, it, it's extremely clear that you've poured your heart and soul into this job, uh, into the success of our unification of Lyndon and Johnson, unlike any other. Um, our success is 
due to your extraordinary leadership, for sure. Um, you have this, I started writing down attributes uh, that I thought of when I, when I think of you, and a couple came to mind, but I think it's actually the, the, uh, the coupling of these attributes, which, which I think make you extraordinarily unique, and that is you're an extraordinarily thoughtful academic coupled with this bulldog-like bulldog -like intensity that I think has served us and the institution well. And, and that's what I'll remember. Um, so, you know, we're extraordinarily grateful for everything that you have, have done for, for the institution. We wish you and Suzanne the very best with whatever comes next. So uh, best wishes. Okay, Penny Hargan next, followed by Sarah. Elaine, this is a sad day for us, but I speak on behalf of Patrick Rogers and the entire admissions team. And I wanna thank you for your passion and commitment and leadership to Northern Vermont University. I know I've told you before, but from the day that you interviewed for the presidency of Johnson State College, we knew you were the best candidate to lead us forward. Little did we know then the challenges that we would face together. In the words of Maya Angelou, who said, I've learned that people will forget what you say, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Elaine, you made us all at Johnson and Lyndon believe in ourselves to do the impossible. You listened to us, you empowered us, and you led us, and most importantly, you reminded us that everything we do, teaching, supporting, serving, coaching our students, whether they're Vermonters or students who come from across the country or around the world, we do it to provide access to a high quality education and help transform their lives. You are the Ellie Puri or St. Pierre of the Vermont State College system, and you deserve a gold medal for your extraordinary achievements in higher education. We wish you the best in retirement, whatever that may be, some well-deserved downtime with family and friends, reading books, playing music, and walking your dogs. Thank you again. We will miss you, but know we will continue to do the good work you set us on the path to do, serving our students to the best of our abilities. Be well and good luck. Sarah Kinnerson, followed by Greg, please. Hi. Hi, Elaine. So uh, February 11th, 2015 was a very good day for us. That was the day that the announcement went out. You had accepted the position. Um, I had the honor of being on the search committee for the president's position. And I can tell you that my inbox was flooding after that announcement went out. Um, so many people were so happy that you were selected. Um, and I'll never forget the day that uh, we interviewed you for the first time, uh, the Zoom interview, you had your big earphones on and you showed up and we, you were a presence, but we were all blown away by what you had to share. And we, I feel like, and Lynn was there as well. I, I feel like we knew pretty, pretty, pretty much right then you were, you were the one. Um, so you came, you um, wowed us all, and we were all excited for you um, to, to arrive for many reasons. A couple of them were your data-driven approach and that kind nature that just brought Penny to tears. Um, and you didn't disappoint. You definitely followed through on um, the things that we expected you, and the way you sold yourself in the interview. And um, you have led us well through these difficult times. Uh, you've always um, remained positive and kept us remaining positive. Um, a little metaphor you shared, a dream, actually I'm turning it into a metaphor. You shared a, a dream with me once uh, where you talked about being in a river and there were big logs that were bumping into you. And I remember thinking if I was in a river with big logs, bump, logs bumping to me, I'd be terrified. And your reaction was, oh, another log, oh, oh, a log. You know, you didn't, seem at all concerned when you were telling me about the, uh, the way you experienced the dream. And I think that's a metaphor for your leadership. Um, you take things seriously, but you don't freak out. And that has been really helpful for us, your calm, steady nature, uh, thoughtful process. And uh, you've been a great mentor to me and many people. So I wish you the best in your next ventures. And thank you so, so much for your six years with us.
Hey, Greg Ekman. Thank you. Hi, Elaine. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to, from uh, from the MBU Athletic Department, um, Johnson and, and, and Lyndon, just thank you for your dedication to our student athletes and their experiences here. Um, you've supported both campuses unbelievably well, um, has have provided great opportunities for our two campuses to compete against each other, whether it's in the President's Cup or different NBU Classics games. Um, there's always been a very healthy rivalry between our two athletic departments and campus, but it was really fun uh, to, to bring the extra added incentive of, of, of competing um, for, for under one banner. Um, so, so that was amazing. Um, the support you've shown out through your six years, um, especially in the last couple of years within our shape facilities um, to make sure not only our students, but also our staff, faculty and community members have a great wellness opportunity um, has really provided a, a big uplift, um, especially in, in times when folks haven't been able to get out. Um, and our campuses are just, you know, uh, beautiful um, and, and having those facilities open and available is, is, is just great. Um, our student athletes just feel greatly supported from you. Um, you're an unbelievable competitor. Um, I remember meeting you um, when the, the welcome barbecue, um, and you were fairly open that athletics was not something you've had much experience with. Um, and then two years later, you're tracking us down in the halls, um, figuring out conference standings and who's going to make the playoffs and what if this happens and that happens. And it all goes along to your data driven. Um, there was very positive things about that. And I had no clue it was going to question about uh, percentages to make playoffs. Um, so whatever our students did, whether it was in Dibden or there's the art students or the meteorology students, you've always been there support us on, on, on many different levels. And lastly, just wanted to really thank you for your work in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we were able to add some different leadership opportunity for our underrepresented students within the athletic departments. And it, it's just great having a platform and having, giving our students a voice and knowing that they have a first generation leader at the top really meant a lot to them. Um, and, and your support that you've shown them um, by giving them a voice and, and the support um, goes very far for what our students feel like and, and why they like to call NBU Johnson and NBU Linden Athletics home. So for, from all of our coaches and from all of our support staff and from all of our athletes, um, it's been fun competing for you. It's been fun uh, wearing uh, with the Badger and the Hornet logo and, uh, and you made us very proud. Um, so thank you very much, Elaine. We have President Joyce Judy followed by Elaine. Elaine, I just want to I want to thank you as your colleague. I know that you came to Vermont to leave Johnson State College, but then you graciously transitioned to leading um, and creating NVU. And your your leadership has watching you do that has just been um, amazing and um, how you brought the two college communities together and created NVU um, is nothing short of miraculous. So um, I want you to know that on behalf of the Community College of Vermont, but also all of Vermont, um, we are grateful to your leadership. On a personal level, I'm really gonna miss working with you. I'm gonna miss the texts and the emails and the phone calls that you and I have had. I'm gonna miss your voice. I'm gonna miss your leadership. I'm gonna miss your steady hand in Council of Presidents meetings. Um, but, you know, we will move forward and you will move forward. And um, I hope you will stay in touch because you have helped lay the foundation for the VSC transformation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Elaine Harvey. President Collins, um, from one Elaine to another, I just wanted to thank you um, for actually inspiring my um, doctoral work coming and um, coming back to NVU after uh, leaving briefly after you started. It's one of the best decisions I've made professionally, and it was mostly because of you and your advocacy on behalf of our students. Um, you've inspired so many educators to uh, to advocate. You know, Jamie Ventura always says we're educators first, um, but I've added to that that we're educators and we're advocates, and that comes directly from you. So thank you, and we're going to miss you greatly. But I'll not be disappointed to accidentally get some of your emails every once in a while. <laughs> uh, Sylvia Plum. 
Thank you, Elaine, for your leadership during our unification and all that has followed. I have so enjoyed working with you, and we have been through so much, creating the brand for, of NBU, finding our message islands, laughing, always keeping our vision front and center, um, keeping the students front and center, sharing our love of music and cooking and culinary history together, and so much more. Thank you for your belief in me as a leader and for your enthusiastic reception and belief in the work of the marketing and communications team. The entire team has so enjoyed doing NBU's marketing and communications work for you, and we will miss you. We have a couple of comments in the chat session. Um, if they want to speak publicly, Beth Walsh and Stephanie Cravetti. I don't know if they're still here. There you are, Beth. I would like to say something. I really do appreciate your support of all of us um, on our campuses and in our communities. Um, and, you know, whenever we met administration on your side and union on my side, I always knew that we were fighting for the same things and we cared about our staff and faculty, students and communities. So thank you so much. We're going to miss you but good luck. And Stephanie? I would like to say something too. I can't seem to get my screen, my video to play, um, but I'll, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. My, my comment, um, I'll just, I'll just read my comment because uh, there have been so many wonderful and well-deserved comments, but Elaine, I will miss you very much. Thank you for all that you have done in your six years to enrich the experience of students, faculty, and staff of JSC and NVU. Thank you for all that you have done to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion on, on our campuses. All best wishes, Stephanie. Uh, Michael Fox. Hi, Elaine. Thank you so much for, for all of your work. Um, I wanted to come back today and um, as someone who stepped away from the Vermont State College system, I want you to understand just how unique your approach is and how much it's appreciated. Um, I feel like I was a student throughout those many years that you've talked about um, where I've taken so much away from the experience as one of your executive team members and working with you. Um, I think we've all benefited as many have articulated um, from your approach, from your tenacity, from your belief in a student-centered approach. Um, it's such an important thing to, to realize that we're here for the students and that never uh, was something that kind of swayed away from any of our uh, initiatives that we took on. So thank you so much and uh, truly wishing you the best as you move forward. And Sandra Noyes. Um, Elaine, I just want to say thank you. From the union point of view, we were so happy to get you and you said that you had worked with unions before during the uh, interview process. That was really important to us. And I also want to say thank you for making us um, keep the positive attitude to just keep trucking on forward, even when things were looking so rotten. And your positive outlook has just helped a lot of us. Now, you know, other people probably said that, but you need to hear it from us too. So thank you very much and good luck with everything. Is there anyone else? Um, I would just like on behalf of the board to say thank you, Elaine. You've been just a positive presence. I mean, everybody has basically said all the things that I think we all know are true and that we really appreciate. Uh, you went out and searched and, and inserted yourself into the communities and got to know the people and got to work with them and involved yourself in a whole lot of other things that were not necessarily related to the college, but really added to the atmosphere and the, the commitment from the communities to your college. Um, one of the things that I've always appreciated about you is your dry sense of humor. Out of the left field is the statement that comes out that's really very funny, a unique way of seeing the world. And I just wanna say, I really always appreciated that. It um, reminds us of our humanity and our humility if we have a sense of humor. And I just wanna say that we're gonna miss you and we're going to continue to do the work that you started with all of your, all of your administrators and staff and for the students. And we hope we are as successful with it as you were. And thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Elaine, have fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay, we've got the next thing is the approval of the minutes of the June 16th Board of Trustees meeting. Um, would someone like to make a motion on accepting those minutes? Uh, who's gonna do that? Speak up, please. Oh, Jim, okay, Jim is making the motion and a second on that. Mary, okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the minutes of June 16th? Hearing none, all those in favor of approval of those minutes, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, opposed, hearing none. Uh, now we have a presentation by Storbuck Search on the presidential search and the screening committee and the work they're going to do. I'm going to turn this over to Megan Kluver who can introduce our guests. Excellent, thanks Lynn. And I think I'm, I'm looking around the screen here and just looking, oh, there's Matt. Um, excellent. So I will turn this over very quickly to Matt and Steve, but very grateful to have their um, guidance as we begin the search process and particularly their help in making sure that we're bringing the diverse voices that make up our community to this search process. So looking forward to launching it today with an, an overview of where we're going and we'll turn it over to you, Steve, please. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting us in to this uh, conversation. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a minute and go through a, a formal presentation. Uh, but essentially what we are hoping to do is give you some overview on what a typical process looks like, give you a sense of who we are. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more formally and ask my colleague Matt Bunting to do the same um, and uh, give you an idea of what the market for presidential searches looks like today. And well, in the last few years, and of course, today is much different than the last few years. Uh, this is primarily designed to give uh, some conversational start to the process as opposed to. Uh, a full facilitation on what you're looking for. That's going to come a little bit later um, in, uh, in the, the, the fall. Uh, but we wanted to have an opportunity to introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about what we see are the key points in this presidential process. We've had an opportunity uh, already to uh, coordinate with Lynn and with Megan, as well as Sophie. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that we can begin the process uh, to find a, a, a great leader for the newly consolidated entity. And we're also eager, as I'm sure everyone else is, to discover what that name might be. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. There will be an opportunity at the end for Q&A. But um, if there are questions as we're going through this, please do not hesitate to jump in. Um, my screen is a little screwy, I have to admit. So I may not see your hand raised if uh, Lynn or, or Megan, if you want to jump in and you see a hand that I don't respond to, I would appreciate it. Uh, but um, I'll get started and we can uh, see where we go from here. So um, what we would like to do is, um, again, focus a little bit on the, the process here. And to start us off, tell, us, tell you a little bit about our firm. Uh, Starbuck Search is, has actually uh, was founded in 2007. I was one of the, the founding partners. Just about a month before the uh, COVID crisis hit, we merged with another firm called Diversified Search. Diversified, as well as Starbuck, share a history of uh, being founded by women, being focused on uh, uh, social justice and uh, non-for-profit, and with a very specific goal at our founding to increase the opportunity for women and people of color to participate in senior leadership roles. For our, in our case, in higher education, diversified a broader corporate uh, not-for-profit world. Um, you all will receive a, a copy of this, this slide deck, so I'll, I'll touch on a few of these pieces, but I won't bore you with just reading off all of them. A key point that I want to emphasize, though, are the last two uh, bullet points, which is the fact that over the course of our history, we have a very proud history of not only uh, being active and doing work so that there are strong pools of candidates, but the people who ultimately become successful candidates stay and are successful. And the work that we have done has been 
positively viewed with our clients so that they ask us to come back and do work for them beyond the presidential level. So we're, we are very proud of that. And I personally believe um, that that is a marker of success be, when people want to continue to work with you. So a little bit about myself. Uh, this is actually my 25th year of recruiting. The last 20 years have been specifically in higher education. I have worked uh, in almost every conceivable type of institution from uh, community college institutions to research ones, public, private, small liberal arts, medium-sized uh, regional comprehensives throughout the United States. I think there is one state, Hawaii, that I've yet to do work in, uh, and then also some work overseas as part of real, uh, partnerships with American universities. Um, I am really excited to have the opportunity to, to be with you today and, and be a partner in this very important process as well. And I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Matt Bunting, to introduce himself as well. Matt. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'll keep this brief as you can sort of get a sense of my background from the slide. Uh, but I'm a managing associate with Sorbeck Search and have conducted all manner of searches, as Steve has, and all manner of institution uh, over the past 10 years or so. And as an FYI, I live in South Burlington, Vermont, and my father, Chuck Bunting, was formerly the chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges from, oh boy, I think it was 1986 or so to 2000. Uh, so this is a pleasure for me on several levels to visit with you folks today and be a part of the search. Thank you, Matt. He's, he's very humble, but we could not do the work we do without Matt's good work. Uh, and I, and as um, a small uh, aside, uh, Chuck Bunting, Matt's father, was also one of my mentors uh, early on in my career as well. So there's a strong uh, uh, Vermont connection in our firm. Um, so I, I do want to give, again, give a brief overview of the process that, that is not atypical. In fact, I would argue is pretty typical of presidential searches because this is a a, a new entity bringing together distinct institutions, there will be an emphasis in uh, our recommendation would be an emphasis on what I define as the outreach or the front end part of the process where there is a strong level of engagement and discussions with uh, individuals and groups through uh, on the campuses and throughout the community. But I wanna give you a, a broader sense of what that can mean. And I, and I want to, make a particularly strong emphasis that these presidential searches by statute as well as practice begin and end with the board. And let me begin there and talk a little bit about the role and the responsibilities that the board has and uh, how it's important for us to be aware of that, discuss that because the board begins the process, the search and screen committee effectively is an import, a board uh, appointed committee and ultimately receives the end, which is to identify and select and then negotiate with the preferred candidate. So I just put in two quotes on this slide that reinforce the, the role and the authority of the board. Um, and the bottom one, perhaps uh, the most immediately important, that is the statute that uh, affords the board the responsibility and the top is the bylaws that uh, play that out. But I don't think there's a way to overemphasize this that the board is central to this decision. The board makes the final decision. Therefore, we need to start with the board to start beginning the discussion about the needs, the wants, the challenges ahead for this president. To give you a broad sense and a very quick overview of what a typical presidential search looks like, we put this chart up. Again, you'll have access to it as well. This is a pretty standard process, um, but we are really looking at, I, I wanna make a few points uh, and as it relates to the board. Um, and I'll come back to that again. We are, of course, we're not even yet on this, <laughs> this, this schedule uh, because we're in August, but we are hoping we could extend that to August through uh, October in the first few bullets there in terms of initial consultation and outreach of the community, the board, the presidential search and screen committee, which uh, uh, that term will come up over and over again. And it's important to recognize that the search and screen committee as empowered by the board is not the selection committee. 
is not the hiring committee. It is it required or asked and charged by the board to conduct the search, attract candidates, screen them, and then identify a slate of recommended candidates for the board to consider and ultimately select from. So much of this process is actually search and screen committee oriented, uh, but I wanted to give you an overview of how it will end as well, or what we'll <laughs> reach it to end. Um, historically, I have found that some of the greatest challenges that we want to avoid has to do, have to do with the fact that um, sometimes there's less than an ideal amount of communication between the search and screen committee and the board so that at the end of the process, the board essentially receives three names or, or whatever number ultimately is asked of the search and screen committee without context. And so one of the goals that we would have throughout this process would be regular updates from the search and screen committee chair to the board so that board members who do not serve on the search committee have a real good understanding and context of what's happening. So that by the time the decision comes back to the board, people feel informed, people feel that they have the information that they need to make a decision, of course, along with the interviews that might take place. So very quickly, we'll begin ideally in September, October, getting the, the search and screen committee in place, beginning that discussion, advertising, recruiting. That process will continue through December into January when the search and screen committee will begin their uh, interview process. So, so in December, January, the search and screen committee will review the applications that we have been able to uh, solicit on their behalf and select a group to conduct confidential initial, probably Zoom interviews. Maybe even a second round interview, depending on how the committee feels strongly or not about the pool that they have. We will also be doing references and background checks at that final stage uh, to ensure that the candidates who ultimately come to uh, the board have been fully vetted. As part of that final stage of the process in March, February, March timeframe, we're suggesting uh, the finalist candidates would make public visits. We're hoping in person, but you never know where, where the world will be at that point. If we need to do it virtually, we've, over the course of the last year and a half, we've become quite experienced in managing that, but we would love to have the opportunity for uh, the finalists to actually visit the campuses, meet people in person, visit the communities in such a way that there's a good exchange, as well as an opportunity for those people who have had a chance to engage with the candidates to provide feedback directly to the board as that part of that process. That's Ideally, okay. yes, Linda. Dave, I'd like to, I'm sorry to interrupt right here, but there was something that you discussed with uh, a couple of us early on, and that is the very first bullet for initial consultation with PSSC and key campus constituencies. Uh, there seem to be, can you elaborate on what you're going to do? I know you said I, before I can. you started. That's a great. You're going effort. to have stakeholder meetings with a variety of different groups that represent the campus and their communities and their Absolutely. other people in the state. Could you elaborate on that, please? I can. And that goes right to my next slide. So thank you. That was a great transition. So um, our focus really here uh, on this search needs to be engaging with as many people who want to be part of this process as possible. Not only because this is a, a, be a newly constituted institution, but because the role of the presidency is now all, all consuming and people really expect the president to, to represent them. So for the first phase of this process in September and a good part of October, we're envisioning a multi-step, multi-engagement process that would involve an online survey to ensure that everyone who's had an opportunity to share their thoughts has an opportunity to do that, a series of open forums, small group, large group meetings with staff, faculty, students, community leadership, the uh, current administrative leadership of the institutions, as well as the board and the, and the system leadership as well. We, this is going to be a very, we're proposing, I should say, a very engaged open process at that early stage where we are able to get the information we need as a practical 
a sense so that we are in the best position to represent you in terms of what you're looking for, but also to make sure there are no surprises. I am a strong believer that this is not, this, this is not a magical formula. It's a very clear process. The, the slide I showed before, in terms of the, the timeline, there, there is no mystery here. There should not be any surprise on what we're doing when we're doing it. Confidentiality relates directly to the, the identities of the candidates themselves, not to what we're doing. And so I want to use our outreach efforts not only to glean the information we need, to effectively identify good candidates and help the search and screen committee process them, but also to ensure that we're answering questions that the community members may have. And, and, and I, I'm, I am a firm believer in bending over backwards to ensure that everyone has a chance to have their voice heard and be engaged in that process. So that list is not all inclusive. Of course, it's gonna be added to as we get further in the process, as well as it never ends. So I can easily see a situation where as we're continuing to recruit, as the, the search and screen committee is beginning the process of reviewing candidates that we have more for, to allow for continued updates, not only on more of the processes, but for individuals to tell us what they're looking for. I don't think there's a, a too late sort of discussion there. So that, that is just the beginning, but we really feel that becomes the starting point that um, the board can hear, the search and screen committee members can hear, as well as we can hear on what people are really thinking about and their hopes and dreams and expectations for the next president. So uh, building on that, I'm, as I alluded to, I'm a firm believer in communication. Again, this, there, there, this, there shouldn't be a whole lot what's going beyond, behind the, the curtain sort of situation. Um, I really believe in a, an extensive amount of transparency. I think that's better for the process. I think it's better for candidates. It's better for everyone in, in the process itself. That starts with a, a presidential search website, which we will work with the, the system folks to develop. And it serves multiple functions, not only to provide regular updates to the community, but information for the candidates. Uh, and what, as we hit milestones, I, I think there is an opportunity for good, solid information on what the search and screen committee has done. Um, and the more information we have out available, and that includes, at least in our thinking, not only the, the broad timeline, the position description, when that becomes available, but also the reports that were drawn up by the legislature, by the, the system that detail what this effort's all about. So being able to share with not only candidates, but the community, what's the basis for this process, I'm hoping can provide us the best opportunity to ensure the best possible people are attracted and they match with the expectations. Um, I, uh, and as I mentioned before, and I alluded, regular updates to the board by the chair, just to ensure that the board is engaged and aware of what's happening and in the best, the best possible position to make the decision at the end. I threw the, the confidentiality piece in not to counteract anything or negate anything above it, but to remind everyone that some of the best candidates, in fact, I would argue probably most of the best candidates, especially right now where we are in the world, are probably not actively looking. They're, they're typically engaged directly in doing many of the things you want them to do somewhere else. And it, it's, the burden is on Matt and I to identify those people at your direction and encourage them to apply. But if they are actively doing some great work elsewhere, I can guarantee that they do not want their name released at a stage when it could undermine the work that they're doing at their home institution or wherever they are. So confidentiality until that final stage is absolutely essential for us to be able to draw the best possible people in. But it shouldn't take away from the communication that we are going to proceed with. It's just a part of the process to remind people. I wanna pause there um, because the next stage I wanna talk about is data that we have on what the market for presidential or what, what the presidential profile looks like today and how that may or may not be different from what you're looking for 
moving forward. So I'll pause there. If, if any of the board members have any questions, I'm happy to go back or, or address any pieces before I get into the next stage of the presentation. Does anyone have any questions? If not, why don't you continue, Steve? All right. Someone? Oh, someone? No? OK. I thought I heard someone say something, but um, feel free to jump in. So um, I, I want to share with you just a snapshot of what the profile of a presidential of presidency and a presidential candidate might look like, or more specifically in the numbers I'm about to share, <clears throat> Um, the American Council on Education runs a regular survey of sitting presidents. The last time they did this and were able to publish this data was 2017. So just keep that in mind as you look at the numbers, because the last year and a half has skewed some of that those figures, and I'll share what that means. So of the 10,000 uh, university, college and university presidents in the United States, including community colleges all the way up. Um, this is a survey of every president. Um, the disaggregated data doesn't vary too much uh, from the overall picture. So in 2017, this is what a typical president looked like. They were 58% um, were age 61 or over, 30% were female, 70 Male, 17% were from underrepresented minority groups. The average tenure was between five to seven years, so six, let's just say. And 81% of the sitting presidents served as faculty at some point in their life. That's what it looked like at that time. More information, just to give you a sense of what position did that president who answered that survey have immediately before they became president in their current role. Most of them came from, as I as, um, indicated, most of them came from higher education. 15% came outside of higher education. What was a significant trend then, which we are continuing to see now, is that of the 85% who were in higher education, only approximately half came out of what has traditionally been the primary pathway chief academic officers. That number has actually been declining for about 15 years pretty consistently. And it has not been replaced by the people coming from outside of higher education. That 15% number has actually stayed pretty stable for almost 20 years. What has shifted within that are two things. Number one, that top bullet. Increasingly, we are starting to see people take on more than one presidency. And so someone becomes a president and then their next move is not necessarily retirement, it is another presidency. But the area of greatest growth has actually come from those people who are in higher education, but not in the academic side. So chief financial officer, chief development officer, student life officers, that those senior leadership roles, other cabinet level roles in higher education has started to become the, a greater and greater source of uh, uh, presidents and, and certainly candidates. Some of that has to do with the changing nature of the presidency. 25, 30 years ago, I could safely tell you, um, and I think you could th safely assume that there was still a bit of the romantic vision of the intellectual leader of an intellectual community. The, today, this role is much more of a manager, strategic planner, financial mind, uh, public relations expert, crisis manager, you name it. It is much more of a holistic uh, leadership managerial role than it has been in the past. That is why we start to see this, this diversification in the sources of potential candidates or uh, candidate prospects. Of course, the last year and a half has, has scrambled all of this because these numbers were four years ago. But the trends are still continuing. As the first bullet in that two slides ago indicated, there is an aging of the presidency. People are staying in this role. Uh, and they come into this role later in their career. And they, um, 
tend to either retire or for maybe some of them move on to another presidency. The decreased le length of tenure, possibility of a second or third presidency, we are, we are expecting that COVID is gonna multiply that trend pretty significantly, in part because the last year and a half has just exposed a lot of vulnerabilities and highlighted areas and skill set that perhaps not every president has, or maybe some presidents do have, therefore they're attracted to other opportunities. Um, I would love to say that the next two bullets have been consistent themes, I would, but the reality is the percentage of women, the percentage of people of color serving in presidencies have seen the plateau in the last few years. And in spite of every effort, Otherwise, uh, the number that we shared earlier has been consistent for the last five, six years. Leading up to that, there had been pretty significant increases, but we are seeing a plateau, which is concerning. But I'm hoping that with the, um, the, the last bullet, the, the retirements and resignations in the wake of COVID, we have an opportunity to really change that. That last bullet, though, I think will be uh, perhaps the defining trend of the next three to five years and how it will impact us in the immediate uh, aspect is that we are anticipating and we're already starting to see it, a huge wave of retirements and resignations leading directly to other searches, leading directly to competition for us. The advantage that I think we have is that this is a unique opportunity of helping to develop a, 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 um, a new unit, a new entity out of historically several. Um, and so the, what I am anticipating is there will be a lot of other presidential searches. We may in fact find ourselves in a position where we might be competing against others, but I do think we have an exciting opportunity that will attract people. So with that, I wanted to thank you for your time in terms of that presentation. There's a lot that we could cover and go through again, and I can repeat or emphasize, but I wanted to uh, share with you a, a few quick items, not so quick, unfortunately, but a few quick items that uh, we felt were that much more important. So I'm gonna stop screen share and just open it back up and ask Lynn or Megan if you, if you wanted me to emphasize anything or uh, speak on other topics. Are there any questions? I think one point, Lynn, maybe just to, to emphasize or, or come back to if you could is, what is the, the timeline around when folks in the, in the community should anticipate outreach? And just what's the timeline of, of what the board should be expecting next? Sure, so the, the, um, let me answer, well, the two questions, so let me answer them in the order and you shared. We are hoping to begin our aggressive engagement outreach to community members uh, through, uh, on all the campuses and virtually, um, probably likely immediately after Labor Day. So in, in September, use most of September for that outreach, those discussions, that interaction that will lead directly to the second part of the question that you asked. Um, our next uh, big milestone is the board retreat at the end of September where the board will um, start really the, the process or start and finish the process of defining the profile for the next president. And so the information that we are gonna gather in starting in September, but also into October will help define what that profile is going to look like, both in the formal sense of a document, but also in the less formal sense of what we need to target or the types of individuals we need to target to attract good, good quality people. Um, so I, I, from a board perspective, I know that there will be some discussions in terms of starting to put together the, the, um, the search and screen committee. Um, and, and those discussions will be starting very quickly. Um, but the, the major board discussions will take place in late September as part of that broader outreach and engagement effort. And I will say that um, as to kickstart that process, um, we have started in initial discussions with Lynn and, and Megan, we have 
put together a, a draft and we're going to work on it of a board questionnaire, which is designed to facilitate some thought process to better facilitate that discussion on what you're looking for in September. So for board members, stay tuned in the next few weeks, you're likely to receive a online survey that will ask you a few questions in terms of values and leadership areas you really want us to focus on, things of that kind, just to help informally set the tone for that conversation later in September. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions or concerns on this process? Steve, I just wanted to clarify, you had also indicated that there would be a survey that might go, that would go out to community members as well. That would be a separate survey, but that would be soliciting input that way as well. Okay. Correct, yeah. So the board will receive one again, just focused on uh, helping us to facilitate those uh, that uh, the discussion at the board retreat. There'll be a larger, uh, more a broadly designated uh, survey that will go out to the community. And broadly speaking, when I say community, I mean, everyone affiliated in one way, shape or form uh, with any of the current independent institutions that are being consolidated into the new entity. Staff, students, alumni, faculty, uh, 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 administrative board, uh, administrative leaders, community leaders. We, we wanna make sure that everyone who has an opportunity has an op uh, wants an opportunity, has a chance to comment on that. So that will be sent out and then you know, probably sent out a few times over the course of S September to make sure everyone has the access to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that is a very helpful thing. Um, we now move on to, if there's no other comments or any questions, we're going to move on to the transformation update uh, from Wilson. He has a PowerPoint from Wilson Garland, and we can move ahead with that. Lynn? Yes. And Sophie, Sophie, I'm, I'm so, very sorry. I may have to sign off. I've been having a medical problem, and I'm waiting to get some um, calls for some appointments, so I, I may have to sign off. It's not for lack of interest, and uh, I appreciate your understanding. That's fine. There was a there was documentation in the uh, papers that we sent out to everyone regarding Wilson's presentation. So that's helpful. If you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you. I'll get, I'll get back in touch if I do. I think, I, you know, I don't know, but it's it's not going too, too well here on the back. That's okay. We, we understand. Thank you. Uh, Jim, do you have something? Um, no. <laughs> Are you, you're still, you're, you're, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I guess, Wilson, you're all set. We can start listening to your presentation on the transformation update and your project management. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk with you again this month. Um, we've been doing a lot in the in the way of, of transformation and getting the, the work organized. And, and I know we've also done a lot in terms of communication and outreach. So I know many of you have been involved in uh, probably reading and, and receiving and, and offering feedback based on those other ways that we're reaching out during the transformation. And I would invite you to continue doing that as we go. Um, I gave a fairly extensive update at the, at the last meeting and, and we'll have an even more extensive update most likely at the, at the next meeting, uh, but did wanna give you a, a quick update on some of the things that we have going on related to transformation. As we talked about at the last meeting, we have a, a new cross-functional approach that we're implementing as part of the, the work of transformation and trying to align the, the work of transformation around the four core process areas that we talked about. And we have a number of the core process teams already kicking off um, and they've drafted their charters, they've identified objectives and deliverables, and now we're convening some sub teams to help with that uh, discovery work. That's really the first part of the process. Uh, we also have an administrative operations team um, and, and sub teams that are being formed and those will be kicked off shortly. Uh, and we're also then across all of the teams uh, providing a, a status dashboard update to sponsors and stakeholders just to keep the lines of communication that are so important as we go through the transformation open and we're getting feedback from the, the relevant parties in that process. 
Um, as we talked about at our, our, our last meeting, we are also working to introduce some additional project management tools into the process as we go, not wanting the processes to take over the, the process itself, but um, really making sure that we have the tools in place where we can uh, manage tasks, timelines, dependencies, and those sorts of things. And we'll have a more extensive update on the project plan and, and timeline at the next meeting. Um, we're also working across the teams really to provide that level of detail. I think in the past, we've pre presented a very high level view of the project plan. And now we're trying as we work with the teams to take it down a level and really get the level of detail that we need to ensure that we are recognizing all the timing dependencies and system dependencies and other things that we need to keep in mind as we're going through this process. Um, and with that, some of the key dependencies that we're uh, putting particular focus on are things that really need to inform everything that we do with the transformation process. Um, so for example, in a few minutes, we'll be talking more about the mission and vision work that is going on to help inform the work around creating this new combined entity. Um, and that's something that not only is important from an accreditation perspective, but in, in doing the transformation work, we really need to know what it is that we're uh, aiming for as, as, a, as a new institution um, and really looking for opportunities to include the um, unique features of the institutions that are, are being uh, joined to form the new combined entity. Um, we also know that there's a tremendous amount of work going on this summer to define the unified program array for the new combined entity. Uh, and we have over 85 faculty who are working on really the hard work of trying to identify what those programs are. And uh, a lot of that work is really critical for us so that we understand what programs we're gonna be offering, where we're gonna be offering them and all of those things that will help to inform the types of processes and supports that we need to put in place across the, the system and across the new combined entity. Um, we're also developing a diversity, equity and inclusion, inclusion framework um, to help inform the work of the teams and be much more intentional about um, how we work that into the, the work and, and both the, the, from a discovery perspective, which is the phase we're in now, as well as design and development, uh, making sure we have the right voices at the table and that we're looking at things through that lens as we go through the work. Um, we're also creating a student advisory council um, and that's gonna be convening here. Um, we're gonna be inviting and, and nominating uh, students as we move into the semester. And uh, by the end of September, we'll have a student advisory committee that will be helping to really inform the process and provide input, um, particularly as we move from discovery into design um, and designing the student uh, experience processes, as well as the academic operations processes and other processes that help support students in, in their learning and help support students in their experience at the institution. Um, and then finally, I think as has already been alluded to, uh, we have a fair amount of work going on right this minute um, to try and uh, do the background discovery and research that's needed to identify a new brand for the, the new combined entity. Um, so I just, I wanted to highlight these dependencies because these are all things that aren't necessarily on the same timeline as all of the other things that we're doing for transformation and in part, um, they're accelerated because they need to inform that work that we're going to be doing um, as we go through transformation. I would, I would just like to add um, quickly um, as well, just to reflect, you know, we have been trying to communicate out uh, the, the transformation work that we're doing. Um, Wilson has held a, a town hall meeting a week or so ago to provide an overview of the project management process. And that was really for people that aren't on these uh, specific core uh, project teams. So they, everyone has the opportunity to understand what this process looks like and what we're doing. Um, he has also held four transformation virtual office hours where people could drop in and ask him questions. Uh, we're continuing to provide the updates every two weeks. Um, as Wilson noted, we have about 85 faculty members currently engaged in the program optimization work over the summer. Uh, there are another dozen or so faculty members that are working on a faculty governance planning team. Um, so far, we've identified approximately 35 people to serve on the academic operations projects teams, about 50 people on the student experience project teams, 
and another 50 on the administrative operations teams. Um, there will be some additional positions to be filled in on some of those teams. And again, with the Student Advisory Council, we're looking at approximately 20 to 25 students um, to participate on that, to provide input and ideas on the work that's being generated by the project team. So I, I just want to indicate this work absolutely couldn't happen without the involvement of so many faculty, staff and students. So we really appreciate um, all the, the input and the feedback and the participation that we're receiving. And there will obviously be more, uh, more involvement moving forward, both on the presidential search that uh, the Storbeck folks were just talking about, but as well as the naming and brand identity work that's currently underway. Okay. And a lot of these details, uh, the chancellor's put, you've put into your transformation reports along the way as we get every week. Right. And I also, we, we publish those on the transformation website um, on the main Vermont State College website too. So all the updates are on there as well with links to things. So for example, the virtual town hall, if somebody wants to go and look at that, it was in the most recent transformation update. And there's a link to the, to the town hall if somebody wants to go and look at that. Is there anything else? Um, that, well, that's all I intended to present is the, the transformation update, but then I'm ready to move on to the accountability matrix. Okay, that sounds ready. good. Yes, thank you. All right. So uh, the topic uh, that we're going to discuss is an accountability matrix. And I know that there's been a fair amount of discussion on this topic in, in the past. Um, you know, the purpose of creating the accountability matrix is really to align accountability uh, to the strategic priorities that have been presented by the legislature and the board. Um, you know, those include affordability, accessibility, quality, relevance, and, and financial stability. And, and those are core areas where we need to align the, the work that we do. Um, and then also to report out on, on progress on the transformation objectives and, and projects, which um, you know, today was fairly brief, but we'll be continuing to, to provide more detail as the teams get deeper into the detail of that work as well. Um, the second thing is really to make sure that across each of these strategic dimensions, we've identified the right key performance indicators that will be used to, to measure the results. The matrix itself shows how the accountability is aligned, but we'll ultimately be creating a dashboard um, and a packet of information uh, that goes with these different uh, key performance indicators in, in future months. Um, we're also wanting to make sure that we document the ultimate accountability at the institution level like for each of the institutions in the, in the system, as well as at the system level. Um, and then also show how those accountability is aligned with the specific committees of the, the board of trustees. Um, so that's an important component of this. Uh, but then within that, uh, many of these areas of responsibility are delegated by the presidents or the chancellor or others to uh, a person who's designated sort of as the lead within um, an institution or, or within the system. Um, and, and we wanna be able to identify that as well so that we have a clear sense of uh, how that accountability transfers. Um, and then the, the matrix itself then also sets the expectations for frequency and, and timing of reporting on the different components. As you'll see when we get to the, the specific matrix itself, a lot of the uh, key performance indicators are not things that we can measure on a weekly or monthly basis, but they're things that are either based on a semester or based on an annual uh, reporting and, and, and so on. So we can see how that sort of uh, plays out. And so the accountability matrix itself, and, and you have a, a full uh, version of the document in your packet. And if it's uh, helpful, I can, I can move to that here in a minute and show some of the, the detail. But as you can see, the idea here is that for each of the strategic areas, uh, we've identified key performance indicators, uh, some of which we have data for today, some of which are, are more aspirational and we're continuing to work on uh, finding a common source of data for some of these, particularly as we're doing the transformation work, one of the key components that we're working on is making sure we have a consistent definition for these different data elements as we uh, combine the work of the different institutions. Um, then you see who the designated lead is for some of this activity, as well as then how that accountability aligns with a, a board committee, um, as well as the timing expected for the reporting 
Um, and we'll need to establish a calendar as we go through this uh, that aligns with the specific board meeting so that we have a clear understanding of what metrics are gonna get presented when and uh, align with the different committee meetings, et cetera. Um, and then the accountability uh, at the institution level, as well as uh, for the system. Uh, so that's that's the overall structure of the matrix. And again, the purpose of the matrix is to align the accountability, and then uh, we will have a, a dashboard and some additional materials uh, as the, we begin producing these different uh, updates. So really our next steps uh, are to gain agreement from the board on this matrix approach. Um, and we're hoping to, to do that today. Um, and then we will be creating a dashboard format for ongoing visibility. And I know that some of the committees like Epsilon and others have had some updates that began to take a look at some of these key performance metrics, but by standardizing around this matrix and then uh, creating these, these dashboards, we'll be able to more standardize the approach to how we report out on these things. Um, and our intent with the dashboard is to have baseline measures, our five-year targets, as well as current progress to date. Um, and then in a following meeting, then we'll establish a baseline and targets for those key performance indicators um, and begin to report out on those as, as we go. Uh, first focusing on the existing measures where data is already available, uh, but then also addressing areas where there are gaps in available data or areas where we need to bring together um, the data from different sources and, and create a common definition and, and practice for how we're sharing that data. So that's, that's the details I wanted to share about the accountability matrix. And I can, I can shift over to look at the specific document if that's helpful. That sounds good. There is apparently a resolution. I don't have a copy of that. Um, well, here's the objective accountability matrix. We weren't looking for a resolution on this. This was really more just for discussion and input. If um, board members had thoughts on on this draft and then the thought was that it would be more finalized and presented at the uh, September retreat. Okay, thank you. So I guess uh, we can go into the accountability matrix now. Thank you. So again, this is just shows how we've, how we've laid it out to address the um, five different uh, strategic priority, uh, six different strategic priority areas. And then uh, also the transformation projects each have a, an accountability lead there as well, um, as well as institutional and, and system level leads as, as well. Um, so in any case, you can see the, the different key performance indicators that we've allocated to each of the different objectives. And you will recognize these objectives. These objectives for the most part are, are ones that were included with the uh, strategic priorities from the chancellor um, last year, and then also uh, some of the key performance indicators come out of the legislation uh, that the, the legislature uh, provided in the most recent update. Any questions or anything on these are the things that we approved originally as a board and approved a while ago? Affordability, accessibility, quality, relevance, and of course, financial stability, which the select group wants us to address. Lynn, I had a question maybe to, to kick us off. Sure, go ahead, Megan. Um, and Wilson, I wonder if we might maybe pull this document down so we could we could see folks while we do questions and then maybe come back to it if that would work. Yep. Um, <laughs> Awesome, thanks. I'm just wondering, and you mentioned that this is going, this sort of pulls from there, there was a, a fair number of different um, data efforts that, that launched in the first year. And I see a lot of the work and discussion from the EPSL committee feeding into here. Um, so I just, I, I think I heard your intent was that this is the set of metrics that we will go forward with and it replaces those other efforts. So we have one streamlined effort 
where everything is encompassed. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that the, the committees won't be the first place that that information gets presented in, in many cases, but um, it really is intended to encompass the things like I believe the, the presentation to Epsil earlier um, included a lot of different graphs and charts that showed some of these metrics. And, and so it would be the intent for this cycle and this uh, reporting to, to replace those other efforts. Excellent. And then just one other follow on question to that, because I know in, in part of these discussions, we've talked about the challenge of gathering data. And I just want to get your sense in looking at the list that you put together, it is comprehensive. How big of a lift is it? And is the lift a burden to baseline this data and then to report out on it currently, given our disparate systems, disparate data sources? Yeah, I would, I would say that, um, as you can see, this is a fairly comprehensive list and, and, and we've gone through somewhat of a prioritization and that we've emphasized things that were either included in the legislation or included in direction from the board. Um, now, there are a few additional items that we've identified either through uh, looking at best practices from other states and other systems. Um, and some of those may be more aspirational and that we haven't really you know, calculated some of those things in, in the past. Um, but I would say as we go through the transformation work, our intent is to really use this as a guideline of where to focus on, on trying to create common definitions and common data sources. Um, but we won't be able to report out on all of it right away. And, and so I, I want to make sure that we're setting the right expectation of, you know, we're not coming with all of these um, already identified and the data already collected. Uh, but as we go through the transformation work, we are intending to uh, find sources for each of these. And really, you know, with some prioritization, focus on the ones that we feel like are going to be the most impactful in our ability to both track our progress as well as measure our ability to achieve the results of not just the transformation, but in general, the, the work that we're doing to achieve our mission and, and vision. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So we're going to keep track of this through EPSL, it appears and some financing facilities and others. Yep. Okay, good. So we're looking forward to that in the future. Um, we have another report here that we also received from um, Nolan Atkins regarding the mission and the vision and his work on that. And when he's ready, we can listen to that. Thank you. Um, I, I'm here to talk a little bit about the importance for developing mission and vision. Um, so I guess that's what I'll do and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, but essentially, you know, we're, we're asking questions uh, in this initial work, like what are we creating? What does the NCE aspire to be? And therefore, what is its vision? What are the purposes of this institution? These are really critical questions that we need to, to answer and we need to answer soon. Uh, and Wilson gave two very good reasons for it. Uh, the first is they're going to guide this transformation work as we build the NCE. Uh, some real basic questions like, who are we gonna serve? How are we gonna recruit them? Um, how are we going to support our students and learners? How will we measure success upon completion of a credential? What academic programs are needed? How will they be delivered? Uh, what physical facilities are needed to deliver programs? What are the co-curricular opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So to really get at all of that work, as Wilson is, is proceeding with, we really need to know what the mission and vision are because all of this work needs to align with the purpose, what we aspire to be. So that's really the first important reason to be thinking about this now. Um, and, you know, 
so the, the, the teams that Wilson has created, the, the student experience team, the academic operations team, the administrative services, workforce development, all of that work has to uh, service or uh, support um, the mission and vision that, that uh, will be developed. The second really important reason is uh, it is one of, it is the first standard uh, within the NECHI standards. The first standard is mission and purposes. And I'm just gonna read one of the substandards because I think it's pretty telling in terms of the importance of thinking about this work now. Uh, substandard 1.1, the mission of the institution defines its distinctive character, addresses the needs of society, identifies the students the institution seeks to serve, and reflects both the institution's traditions and vision for the future. The institution's mission provides the basis upon which the institution identifies its priorities, plans for the future, and evaluates its endeavors. It provides a basis for the evaluation of the institution against the commission standards. In other words, in all of the subsequent standards, you must have your mission and vision in mind. When you're developing strategic thinking and your strategic plan in standard two, which is planning, the planning standard, you must have the, the mission of the institution in mind when you're developing your strategic priorities, for example. So this is really critical that, that we think about mission and vision now, given the fact that, that the work of transformation has already commenced. So I'll just stop there um, and see if there are any questions. Uh, any questions for Nolan Atkins? If there aren't from anyone else. Um, I'm gonna ask Nolan, you have a lot of work here that you've listed. Um, who did you consult with or how did this, this list for both the guiding principles, the vision concepts, the other are parts of this document? Where did, where, who contributed to that? Uh, who's contributed, uh, there's, so having developed an initial concept, uh, I have shared this and consulted with the Council of Presidents. Uh, the Council of Presidents or the presidents from the, each of the institutions have shared it with senior leadership teams on their respective campuses. It's been shared with Vision Point. Uh, we need their perspective. And when Vision Point is going to, in their uh, upcoming listening tour, they're gonna to start uh, presenting these ideas more broadly to gain uh, the input and feedback of, of the broader community. Uh, so in fact, uh, it is essentially what we're doing is we're increasing the, the circle of, of, uh, of uh, influence here. So they will, uh, articulate and discuss these ideas in the listening tours they visit each of the campuses. Really, I think we're looking for support of the guiding principles at this point in time. Right, so there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of input to be provided. So what we're seeking is, um, you know, we have uh, Nolan again with input from others has come up with a series of guiding principles. So what we're really looking for is for support from the trustees on those guiding principles. And then as we expand out uh, the work on the mission and vision, those guiding principles will help inform that work as we move forward. So rather than have people start from scratch on, you know, like, what are we gonna do? Why are we doing this? So the thought was it would be helpful to have guiding principles uh, for this mission and vision work. And it was also important to provide information uh, to Vision Point when they're doing their audience uh, research and brand marketing, you know, to to explore these concepts, ones that resonate with, you know, future students, with communities, et cetera. So um, this is really just the very early stages. You know, the board will ultimately um, approve the mission and vision for the new institution, but that's a ways down the road. This is really at the very early stages here um, to set the stage and get the conversation going and starting to um, include more people as we as we think about this moving forward. Okay, that's helpful. 
there is a there is a discussion here about a resolution on the guiding principles that we need to move as a board to accept the guiding principles. Does anybody have any questions about that? Or can we accept a motion to uh, accept these guiding principles for the work in developing a mission and vision? Um, I had a question. Yeah, I had a question on one of them. Um, I, I think these are the right ones, right? And where it states, uh, along with CCB, the NCE will be the affordable and accessible public institution of higher education for many placed place bound learners. Um, what what is a place bound learner? Yeah, that's a good question. We're trying to get at the fact that uh, many learners in our communities and many of our rural communities uh, cannot travel, cannot go elsewhere to access higher education. So that's what I mean by place bound. Mm -hmm. So meaning that the uh, ability to physically get to a Vermont State College location is important versus remote learning? I'm, I'm not sure I still understand. Yeah, it's important. And uh, it, it's important to be able to get to a physical location. Uh, many learners are, are willing and able to learn remotely. Others uh, will benefit from that physical presence on a campus or at a learning location, learning in some face-to-face -face mode or some hybrid of the two. But that face-to-face physical presence will be important for many of the, the place-based learners, learners or is important. So I guess I had two, two comments on that one. One is, um, I'm, I'm sure you spent a lot of time on wording it, but that I, I didn't understand what that meant. Um, so I don't know if there's better clarity, even with a footnote. Um, I also think that statement um, almost makes decisions. Right? If we're going to say that we're going to be physically accessible to everyone, um, it means that we have to have a physical presence in places. Not necessarily maybe the way we do it today, but um, uh, I just found that one line to really put a pretty big stake in the ground. And um, anyways, that's my observation. I would just share, I know at least through the work of the select committee, um, that there was recognition that it's that rural institutions play a very important role in the communities where they are. And one of the reasons, not only economically, but also the access piece, because there are students that if you're not physically present will not otherwise access higher education. So um, it's to the benefit of Vermont to have physical presence for students um, as well. Again, um, multiple modalities where we can open up um, courses to students across the state is also important, but there is real significance to having a physical place in rural parts of the state where otherwise there are people that will not be able to access um, particularly four-year degrees without having those campus locations. Okay. So I don't necessarily disagree with that philosophy or thinking. I just think it comes with significant implications it does to the, to the strategy. And so I just didn't want that one in particular to go kind of unnoticed by the trustees if we're going to use this as guiding principles and how we do work. So I, I appreciate you calling that out, Jeanette. Um, from my perspective, I think that that is a critical um guiding principle and I'm pleased to see it highlighted as part of uh, Nolan's work. Are there any, when the select group was meeting, it was during the course of the um, winter um, and during the course of the winter with the last year's academic year, there was more remote than there had ever been available to our students. Um, were there any lessons learned or any people who got access to education? I mean, just this is anecdotal evidence, uh, but was there more accessibility because we were more remote and they were not available to go to a campus? Was there, did the hybrid situation promote that? I mean, how did that actually 
play out? I think we do have anecdotal information that there were people that were able to access education remotely last year that otherwise would not have been able to access it. Um, and I know one example was um, that I, I know one of the faculty members at Vermont Tech shared with me was a, um, a 37 year old stonemason in Peacham who was able to take courses last year. Um, but then if, if VTC didn't make those courses available again uh, for this coming year, we'd be unable to complete his degree. So having been able to sort of start on a degree um, through online, he wouldn't be able to continue and complete it unless those opportunities were still available to him because of his, his work and his life otherwise. Um, certainly one of the challenges in certain parts of the state, we still have those broadband and connectivity issues. Um, so, it, you know, there definitely is still... Um, concerns there that need to be addressed. And I'm, I see Joyce has put her screen on, so I am quite sure Joyce has other wisdom to share with us as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I will respond to Lynn's um, question about lessons learned in, um, because I would say that um, Janet, um, your question, um, I think is a good one. Um, CCV is definitely the outlier in this because we do, we aren't, so we don't believe so much in place-based. We are trying to really, I mean, this fall, for example, only 19% of our classes are gonna be in person. Mm -hmm. And our enrollment is so far looking really strong. So it's really a difference in philosophy um, because I believe that CCV has a responsibility to help people learn to learn online because if we look to the future, professional development and all of that is going to be, um, you're gonna be accessing it virtually and online. So how do we think about um, moving away from, and I get that the college campuses are place-based and they're such a vital piece of the community. So it's a, it's hard to reconcile those two pieces. So I don't want to, um, um, influence that, but I will say that I think, um, from a CCV perspective, we are thinking much more, much less about geography based and more about how do we make programs accessible in a variety of ways that allow people to um, learn remotely. And some of the lessons we've learned, I will say that one of the, I think the a popular modality that is gonna continue post COVID is um, synchronous online where people have the benefit of having a classroom experience, but they're um, along with online, but they don't have to drive to a location. They can they can access a course, you know, maybe every other Tuesday night from six to eight, and they're with their, their faculty member and students remotely. And then the balance of the class is done online. So they get the best of, in some ways, the best of both without having to travel. Any other discussion, Pat? Thank you. I just wanted to piggyback a little bit with a slightly different, um, response than what Joyce offered. And, and thank you, Janet, for bringing this up. I mean, yes, we too learned a lot of lessons during COVID about the ability to deliver decent and well thought out uh, online content. However, at Vermont Tech, a lot, all of our programs require a connection with a hands-on lab experience, be it clinical or labs here on Randolph Center campus or in Williston. So finding that right balance of what can be remote delivery, but still enable students to get that hands-on experience is really critical. But we too are looking at how can we offer more remote delivery? For example, this fall, our mechanical, our computing, computing and engineering programs will be offering all their 1000 level courses online. And the plan is to add 2000 level, 3000, 4000, till we can eventually provide that in what, we're calling, what is called a high flex model. So that students can be here in person, in class, in lab, or they can take it asynchronously through a recorded experience and then come for low residency lab opportunities. So, and, and we're also looking at how might we decentralize delivery of our programs, either working through our career and tech ed centers that have lab facilities. So I think that non-place-based answer is going to be different for various programs. Also, we also hope to maintain an opportunity for a traditional residential experience. We know that we've got to open up our programming to be more remote for working adults and other non-traditional students. So 
that's a that's a wave of the future. One I would argue we're probably a little behind schedule on within many parts of the Vermont State Colleges, but more specifically here, but something we want to catch up on quickly. So I think it's a combination of place-based traditional, but also an opportunity to capture new markets by providing other modalities to reach out to students. My thought. Uh, we have Thomas Muse Pugh. All right, thanks. Um, at Castleton University, one of the things we realized this past year is that um, the online learning was a real boom to a lot of students who had access difficulties. At the same time, we had a considerable number of students who took a leave of absence or deferred matriculation because their preference was for face-to-face -face education. So it, the online better served some students or at least facilitated their access and it discouraged others. We also have more than a third of our students are out of state. Um, they come here primarily in a residential capacity and it's unclear that we would attract those students through a strictly online program delivery option. So it's a real mix. Um, some anecdotal surveys, this is not statistically uh, verified, suggest a number of students want to mix. They want to be able to take some courses online and they want some face-to-face. -face. So they, there's recognition of the convenience and the ease, particularly around scheduling with the asynchronous online, but there's also uh, still a significant demand for person-to-person, same-time, in-place contact. Okay. So um, to, to, to both the, to all the comments from the, the, all of the last three speakers from the institutions, and I just posted in the chat the, the line that maybe addresses what I'll call that flexibility or being able to, to do it this way and that way, um, that's, that's less explicit, right? Unless it's implied in the maintained focus on quality access, maybe that's what you meant. Um, but um, when I read these the first time and I saw that in place, what I didn't see was, it, I almost read it as, um, uh, as not focusing on the other types of learning, the remotes and, and other methods. So uh, whether that's implied under the word access or whether it's missing from the list, you know, that we're trying to also be flexible to, to various ways to educate. I just didn't see, I didn't see that um, unless it's implied in one of the other lines and I didn't understand. Okay, Nolan? Yeah, I, Jan, I mean, that that's the intent. The intent is uh, a multimodal solution. There is no one solution that will meet all of the learners that the NCE will engage. And I think you've heard examples from, from Tom, Pat and others. Um, so I guess that's what I mean by access. Uh, different students will access programs offered in different modalities, modalities that attend to these pieces, the quality, the access, cost and, and relevance. So. It's, it's, it's really a, a multimodal solution is, is being the intent here. Any further discussion or questions? Does that clarify things, Janet? Go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, first of all, I uh, support what you said about why these statements are so important because I do believe you use them as decision-making guardrails. Um, and so I just want to make sure that you know, as trustees, if, if we are going to, if we have to approve these in whatever format that we as trustees understand that there's guardrails now, right? And are they guardrails that we can achieve our goals with for the system? Um, so those are the, that's why I think this one on um, place-bound learners is a very important statement that we have to recognize is there. Um, and if uh, access means, um, all these kinds of ways people can learn, uh, I can live with that. Bill? So uh, we, we were just talking about the presidential search previously. Mm -hmm. We're talking here about a vision and mission statement for the 
NCE. Um, and I think it's, so I think, it, interestingly, the very last question on page four of this document says, the new president will need to support this vision and have the skill set to advance it. And so I think the linkage between this work and the presidential search is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I think we need to observe that and be aware of that and think about the timing of the two processes because we're not, it's my understanding, we're not, it's not our intent to hire a new president to try to define the mission and vision for the institution. We're hiring a new president to implement mm -hmm. the vision and mission of the new institution. And in order to hire that person, we need to have this clarity so that the search process can use it as part of the search process. So, <clears throat> so I think we need to just be clear and, and understand the timing of coming to closure on some of this work in order for it to be effectively used in the presidential search process and that we're clear that that's what we're doing. And I don't know, maybe I missed it or maybe it's clear, but I think just to understand that the two go hand in hand. Okay, Nolan, I'm going to ask you a question as a follow-up to that. Um, as the lead person on this mission and vision and what you plan to do as the leader of this, this process going forward, um, what are the next steps and what is the timeline as we head into this presidential search starting, let's say in October? That's, that's what I'm wanting to try to make sure we understand and have a clarity of how we're moving them forward together. Yeah, and I'd also like to add that also lines up with our matrix of accountability and our KPIs. I mean, this is for Wilson working with you and the presidents. And can you clarify that a little bit for us so we understand where we go next? Sure. Uh, I think the, the next step is to broaden the circle. And so Vision Point's going to do that in their listening tour. So they're going to gather more input and feedback about these ideas uh, in that process. And that's gonna help refine these ideas. I mean, this is a proposal at this point. So really we're just seeking support for the guiding principles. The guiding principles along with expanding the circles going to refine these ideas. Uh, in terms of timeline, time, time is of the essence. Uh, the transformation work has begun. Uh, the core teams are meeting. The sub teams are starting to meet. So our hope is that we'll have essentially a mission and vision to, to share in October at an Octo October board meeting for, for your consideration and approval. And I think that would dovetail well with the, the search timeline as it's been articulated. The, the other piece I would add is that, um, you know, we, we're currently looking at um, the October board meeting as being when we would discuss brand and identity for the new institution. So I think this will bring, bring the pieces together well um, to have it come back to the board in October. Okay. I'm trying, I think we're trying to get the timeline so we see where we decide what and how they relate to each other. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, we have, I don't have the resolution with me. Um, I don't know if any, I think that said it went out in October, on August 3rd. Um, yeah, the, the resolution is, it is posted uh, in the board materials um, that are posted on the website. Um, I don't know if I have access to share my screen. Nope, I don't. Um, but I don't know no, if Jen. So it's the gist of the resolution is that we are approving the guiding principles to move forward as we work on this mission and vision. 
Is that what it is? That right. The, okay. That. If you want, I can read it out if that would be helpful. That would be helpful. Thank you. So it's resolution number 2021 uh, 020 adopting guiding principles for developing the mission and vision of the new there university. Is. Okay, there we are. You don't need to listen to me. <laughs> Everyone can see that. So it's resolved that we adopt these guiding principles for developing culture and university combined identity of our rural communities for an affordable institutional mission. Uh, farther down. Okay, farther down. Is this the inclusion of all of these things? We're still not at the place bound learners. Uh, where are we? It's right there. Yes, establish the NC with this. Okay. So basically, this is a, a resolution that states that these guiding principles are what the board approves. Obviously, we're, they're not set in concrete. These are, this is a work in progress. Is that correct? That's correct. This is to help inform the work as, as, the, as people come together to work on the mission and vision. Okay, is there a motion for this? Okay, Karen, makes, uh, Karen Luno makes a motion, second by Ryan Cooney. Any further questions or discussions or have we clarified what we're doing here? Pat, I did have one question. I sure, Shirley, go ahead. Um, at the end, when you say learn local, apply globally, what is the significance of that? Yeah, and, yeah. Why, and why do you need it in this resolution? Uh, you know, in, in thinking about the mission and vision, um, a lot of the concept that's being developed uh, envisions learning, uh, addressing problems within local communities. And so the idea here is that we're not going to create learning experiences that are myoptically focused on one little, on a particular problem within a particular community. Rather, they're addressing problems that are certainly relevant within our communities and state, but can be um, more broadly applied to national and global significance. So for example, uh, you know, part of our programming array could have programming in the area of environmental climate related science where students and faculty are working on climate environmental issues in our local communities that are very, very significant and will help to solve the problems in our local communities, but they're scalable. They're also applicable on national and global scales. And that's the kind of learning that we would want to, to support and develop. And you don't have that in the rest of the other premises? that you could still do the same thing with, it's nothing else. Um, uh, is this a, a catch-all clause? What, is, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is that I just find it unusual and maybe it's just me. And if I saw this and someone would ask me, well, why don't you have learn locally and apply globally? But that's just yeah. Me. It's 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 meant to. It's almost meant to be something of a tagline, really. Um, that summarizes. Pardon? Or you could use it as a catch-all. A catch-all. That's right. A catch-all for catch some of the thinking that follows. Okay, that that's right. answers it. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we have a motion on the table. No further discussion. It doesn't appear to be. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any, any opposition? Okay, so Nolan, you've got your work cut out for you. Thank you. Um, we will be seeing more of that again. Um, now we have the approval of federal HERF funding 
Uh, Sharon Scott will go over that with us um, as we look at what that involves. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for a few minutes. I hopefully will only take a couple of minutes of your time. Over the last couple of uh, cycles, the Board of Trustees has approved higher education emergency relief grants. They're also known as HERF grants for our member institutions of the Vermont State Colleges. The latest round of HERF grants, um, known colloquially as HERF-3, were created as part of the American Rescue Plan that was signed into law on March 11th, 2021. These grants have now been awarded to our colleges and require Board of Trustees approval before we can actually receive them. Normally, these requests, as you know, would first go to the Finance and Facilities Committee before coming to the board. However, the timing of receipt of the materials, and you'll see that some of them were only received in the last week, as well as spending requirements did not allow us to do so in this case. So as shown on page 26 of your packet, the total grant awards um, are $22.5 million, which is composed of $11.6 million in emergency aid to students and $10.9 million in institutional funds to respond to the pandemic. The emergency aid to students will be awarded in the coming weeks and months, and the institutional funds will be used to address pandemic-related deficits and lost revenues. Mm -hmm. The expectation is that these funds, the institutional ones, will be uh, result in carry forward for FY22 into FY23, which will help us with our budget forecast for the next upcoming fiscal year. So the request today is for you to approve the HERF-3 grants as shown on page 26. And the total awards, if you're looking inclusive of all HERF funding, um, is also shown on the bottom of that page. So we have, uh, we need a motion to approve these, these funds. Ryan making the motion, who seconds it? Sean Tester seconds it. Any discussion or questions of Sharon Scott? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving these funds for the use of the institutions and for student aid, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, I assume no one's opposed. Um, okay, Sharon, good luck. Thank you. Well, these, this money will come in handy, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And I know the colleges and the students are very anxious to be able to get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have um, some policies that we received in our packet. Um, under additional business, uh, we're going to ask uh, the uh, general counsel to um, go over those first. Thank you. I'm trying to pull it up myself. <laughs> so uh, we, um, in, in response to a change in federal legislation that relates to the educational benefits available to veterans, uh, the, we are looking to revise policy 301 uh, specific to veterans and the residency requirement uh, for in-state benefits that they receive, in-state tuition benefits they receive. The, um, the change in law removes a three-year time frame, which was the time frame uh, uh, specified by the earlier law within which the veteran must have begun a veteran or a, 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 a beneficiary of a, a veteran, uh, removes the time frame that they must have begun their um, educational pursuits in Vermont. And the newest legislation, um, which is part of a very comprehensive uh, and lengthy uh, law that passed, um, I believe, at the end of last year, it removes that three-year requirement. So we are removing in Policy 301 the three-year time frame. Uh, the federal law now makes it clear that the veteran should does not have to have completed their, um, their education within the three years. They don't have to have begun their education within the three years of discharge from military service. So it expands 
the offerings of, um, of in-state tuition for the veteran for that purpose. And it's a pretty, um, so there are many other changes in this, in this law, but this is the one that we address within policy 301. I don't believe the others require policy changes, at least not at this time. And so we have presented to you policy 301 revisions. You can see there's a clean, clean version as well as an edited version. And I'm not sure if, if people have those in front of them or if they want them on the screen to see what we did. Um, so please let me know what you'd like. Does anyone have any questions or do we need to put it on the screen? Seeing no questions, we need to have a motion to accept this new version, updated version of policy 301. Do I have a motion? I'll move. Karen, Karen Luno has a motion. Ryan Cooney seconds it. Any other um, discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of updating the policy 301 for in-state tuition to comply with federal law, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, um, yes. Um, I, I do have a question that's for the presidents in general. Okay, um, go ahead, do, Karen. Do we have any idea about um, veteran use of the BSC in general and in particular? Oh, go ahead, Pat, why don't you start? Um, yes, I can't give you numbers right off the top of my head, Karen, but for example, our professional pilots program is a very popular veterans program, and I see Ryan shaking his head. Um, we have other programs that veterans um, come to seek certification, et cetera. So yes, we have some pretty significant veteran uh, impact. It, it varies year to year. And of course, we have agreements with the National Guard around uh, trying to promote the National Guard scholarships that are available to students. So um, there, you know, that, that veteran slash military presence is significant for us and I suspect all. And we'll go to Joyce. Um, Karen, um, usually, and I don't have the figures for um, this summer, but usually we serve about 300 military and military connected students a semester. And every year at graduation, we do a special thing with the governor um, and we graduate anywhere between 20 and 30 uh, uh, veterans each year. So it's a pretty significant, and we actually have some special funding from two philanthropists. We have a full-time veterans um, counselor and have done a lot of work on that. And I'm happy to, sometime if the board wants an update, I'd be happy to have um, Kyle Ames um, come and share what we do um, with veterans because we're pretty proud of that. And it's a really important uh, population for us. Yeah. And Elaine Collins. We're also noted as a veteran friendly campus and uh, have programs that are um, of interest to veterans. We have a very active uh, veteran involvement through our veteran summit that is an annual event and um, has been offered both on the Linden campus and on the Johnson campus, as well as taken to Burlington uh, for wider participation. So very active on the veteran scene. Uh, Thomas. Yeah, sorry, Jonathan Spiro couldn't be here today. We enroll between 50 and 70 veterans every semester. And we have an active presence on campus. Yeah, I remember a few years ago at one of the CCV campuses, we did get uh, some people who talked to us about their efforts for veterans and the, and the concerns that some of the campuses have and some of the colleges had with uh, veterans being able to participate as students. Um, sometimes it was, it's different from what you do when you're in the service 
And then when you're an independent person questioning and participating in class, uh, maybe Joyce can remember that presentation. Yeah, and I would just say also there was a really nice CAX clip uh, last week on the Veterans Town Hall and it featured Kyle Ames, who is our veterans person. I mean, I think it was last Thursday or Friday. Mm. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, for all of us, the transition from military life to civilian life is is difficult for many students. And so the as much support as we all can provide to them in that transition, whether it's on a college campus or at CCD is really um, it's really important. And, um, I think this is very useful information and I recall having conversation about it several years ago, but I'd like to request that we keep this particular piece of data um, up front and center for us as a piece that we look at with regularity as we look at other things with regularity and and if if it's possible to um i think keeping it in focus means that it's it's a point of improved efforts that we're always focused on doing if we're doing it well doing it even better i think it's a very important issue and it's a very important population for us not only to serve for them but to serve for the system they, I think veterans bring a very interesting perspective to the classroom. And um, obviously to society as a whole, once, once they increase their education. My, maybe Epsil has that somewhere in what it looks Another like. Another data point for Wilson Garland and his KPIs. I, I think, yeah. He has nothing else to do, right? <laughs> I think Epsil was tracking sort of demographically who our students are. So I, I believe that is something that we've been thinking about, but doesn't hurt to make sure we've, we've got it included. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good point. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions on additional business? Uh, seeing none, um, we are going to ask for public comment and I'm asking uh, Jen Poirier if she has anyone who has signed up or anyone who'd like to share their or ask questions for us at this time. Uh, anyone in the public who'd like to leave a comment, you can raise your hand now. I do not have anyone signed up at the website, but now is the time public to raise your hand. Okay. Well, seeing none, we can go into board training. Um, I guess I'll turn this back over to the general counsel and we can proceed with board training on uh, policy 311, policy 311A and policy 316. That's right, thank you. Um, I also wanna welcome Catherine Santiago, who is the Assistant General Counsel and System Investigator. And she and I will be co-presenting uh, this training. Um, and Catherine, I think that you were gonna put the slides up. Is that right? Is it working for you? It is not, I'm, it's disabled for me. Okay, this, I um, will, I think oh, I- can. One second, we can make that happen. Hold on. Okay. Great, great. Um, while that is, is getting up, um, so 311A, 311 and 316 are three policies um, that the VSC has uh, to address our obligations with specific legal challenges. And we are talking about sexual misconduct, discrimination, harassment, and abuse of minors. This training will provide trustees with an overview of these policies, as well as provide specific information regarding a trustee's role in safekeeping our communities. The overview here, so we're, we're talking about Title IX regulations in particular, and those changed um, August 14 of 2020. Many of you were here as we went through those policies in detail. Uh, prior to uh, voting on the, the changes in our own policies to reflect the 
federal uh, legislative changes and uh, not legislative, federal regulatory changes. So the policies that we revised last year are 311A and 311. 311A specifically um, involves sexual harassment and assault, other sexual misconduct. 311 addresses discrimination and harassment. And 316 is about the protection of minor, minors, mm -hmm. uh, which is a relatively new policy that the VSC adopted about two years ago. I'm going to have Catherine, who is uh, going to lead you through the Title IX regulations as well as 311 and, and 311A. Thank you, Patty. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll begin with uh, Title IX regulations. And so Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972 addresses discrimination uh, based on sex, and it applies to any school that receives federal monies. Um, it also protects all constituents of the VSC and is enforced federally by the Department of Education. The current iteration of the Title IX regulations became effective, as Patty mentioned, August 14, 2020. Uh, the regulations were controversial and remain so and are being reviewed currently by uh, the immediate administration. So there may be some adjustments in the future um, as we go, go on, but as at present, the current regulations are still in force and effect. Um, so the, um, the Title IX harassment is distinguished uh, by three areas. The first being quid pro quo, which is something for something. Uh, the next is severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive behavior. And the final one is sexual assault as defined uh, by the Cleary Act. And Cleary defines it as any sexual act directed against another person without consent of the victim, including instances uh, where the victim is capable of consent. It includes rape, fondling, incest, as well as statutory rape. Um, so just some background, uh, the Cleary Act is the Gene Cleary Disclosure of Campus Security um, and Campus Crime Statistics. And the aim of the Cleary Act is to provide transparency around campus crime policy and statistics for any crime that poses a serious or ongoing threat. It was signed into law in 1990. Um, it was after an attack in 1986 and homicide of a college student, um, Gene Cleary. It applies to all colleges that receive federal funding. It includes the report of many violent crimes. In regard to sex-based crimes, it includes dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, and in the reports, the personal information of uh, the individuals involved are not released. So Title IX and the current regulations. Uh, colleges must take action when a three-prong um, standard is met. And so the prongs are actual knowledge by the college, um, the prohibited conduct happened in the college educational program or activity, and it, it occurred within the United States. So those are the requirements in order to be, uh, uh, be able to be um, go through the specific Title IX process. And so we'll move on to how that relates to policy 311A. And so policy 311A incorporates the requirements of Title IX into the VSC system and applies to the colleges as well as administration. And so the policy is contained there below um, most of us are familiar with those, but it's there for you to uh, review. So policy 311A along uh, with the scope of coverage uh, um, as defined by Title IX is incorporated herein. So if you take a look, um, and we're gonna discuss the scope of coverage shortly, 
but there's also an emphasis on the, the newest iteration of Title IX and how it's incorporated into 311A. And so the emphasis, um, which is a little bit new, is the prohibition on retaliation as it explicitly extends to people who decide not to participate in investigations. So um, that is, there was also always the pro prohibition on retaliation, but, and I think it was presumed that it extended to that, but the new um, regulations make it very explicit that someone either um, declines to, to um, be involved or declines to speak or be involved in an investigation, there isn't retaliation that can occur. Um, additionally, um, the preferred uh, terms um, that uh, I think have been uh, best practice for quite a few years have been codified and are now required. And we included that in 311A as well. And so the complainant um, is used throughout to reflect uh, the person who was allegedly aggrieved uh, by um, the person who is uh, being accused, who's known as the respondent or of exhibiting the prohibited conduct. And so the complainant is the person, whether or not they filed a complaint or came forward, that is the person who is identified as the complainant. So they're not required to report, they will be identified as the complainant. So looking a little bit closer at the scope of coverage of 311A, um, so here we delve into some of the factors used to determine whether prohibited conduct occurred uh, within a program or activity. Um, the prohibited conduct is uh, bifurcated. So there is Title IX sexual harassment, and that reflects all the requirements of the Department of Education um, that we previously discussed. And then there's non-Title IX sexual harassment, which includes the prohibited conduct, but um, it alludes to behavior that may have happened off campus or outside of a program or activity of the college. So it allows uh, the colleges to address behavior that may be inappropriate and prohibited conduct that may have not have been captured um, under uh, Title IX sexual harassment. So policy 311A, the scope of coverage as to the specific Title IX sexual harassment includes um, the six general areas, which is quid pro quo, severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive, which is a shift um, from prior standards, which were not as stringent. Um, the next category is sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and sex-based stalking. Um, and then in comparison, the Title IX, as I mentioned before, non-Title IX sexual misconduct is mostly the same conduct um, as the Title IX sexual harassment, except for the broader application outside of the program and activities. So separate that from the policy, there are the implementing procedures. Um, and so just to have you familiarized with the implementing procedures themselves, um, what they do is provide the details uh, for supportive measures, the resources that are available to students and employees, and it provides uh, the process for reporting complaints, selecting an outcome or a route that that complaint could take, um, notices, investigations, reports, hearings, sanctions, and appeals. And so all of those are very detailed and um, followed extensively in the implementing procedures and it gives timeframes, it uh, provides expectations for um, um, constituents who are going through the process and it gives them a place to refer. So in regard to the implementing procedures and the outcomes, the complainant may request a remedy or an outcome and the complainant has a variety of choices. So they may choose no action. So they may divulge that there was behavior, but they are deciding not to take um, any formal or informal action. Um, they may also choose to file an informal complaint. Um, and if appropriate, um, deemed appropriate by the Title IX coordinator, that will be something that would be pursued. And some of the options there to resolve 
informal complaints or informal resolutions or mediation. Um, they could also utilize restorative justice um, model approaches in, in order to resolve those. And then a final um, outcome that can be chosen is a formal complaint, which results in a formal decision. And so in rare, that will go through what the formal decision and who is responsible for the formal decision shortly. But in rare circumstances, I just wanted to point out that if there is behavior that is egregious enough, um, in rare circumstances, the Title IX coordinator does have discretion to move forward with a complaint even if the complainant does not wish to file um, a complaint. And so that is reserved for the most egregious matters, but certainly that is something that is well considered. And then in that realm, the, the, the university is moving forward with the complaint on behalf of the complainant. So who makes the formal decision? Um, in a formal complaint, if a formal complaint process is selected, it results in the formal, the formal decision. Um, and that formal decision is made by the responsible college administrator. Um, and so the assigned responsible college administrator depends on the status of the respondent actually. So it's not so much within the scope of who the complainant is, it depends on um, who is alleged to have committed the inappropriate behavior. So, um, if this respondent, it will look at whether the respondent is a student, an employee, the chancellor or a trustee, and then related to who the respondent is, they go to the accompanying, as the, the, the slide mentions, that person um, would be deemed a student or president or the board chair would be the responsible college administrator. So contained within the policy, there are reporting responsibilities. And so our uh, policy requires that all VSC affiliated individuals um, report behavior that may violate 311A um, or be prohibited conduct. If you become aware of a violation, um, you are required to report to one of the following individuals. So the first being a college Title IX coordinators, and these are listed um, in the appendices in the implementing procedures and also on, um, on a link um, that will be provided as well. And it's regularly updated because it changes because people transition to new positions or new roles. So it is great to kind of double check that um, resource to make sure you're reaching out to the appropriate um, Title IX coordinator. But even if you get it wrong um, or it's not quite the, the the, the perfect fit that they'll make sure you get to the right person and pass that information along. Um, you could also report to the college dean of students, college president, and if it is related to the office of the chancellor, uh, the director of human resources. So what should be reported? What should you report? So it's recommended and encouraged that you pass along all information that was shared with you um, however, do not, in conversations with whomever you're receiving the information from, do not elicit further information or try to um, ask, you know, investigate or conduct a mini investigation. The reasoning behind that is to reduce the number of times a complainant may have to recount their experience and also to preserve the integrity of the investigation. Um, certainly, if you pass that information along to the Title IX coordinator, um, immediately, the Title IX coordinator reaches out to the complainant to provide resources, support services, and, and get the necessary information to move um, the complaint along and figure out the route that it will be taken. So we wrap up in regard to 311A, um, and so we're going to move on to policy 311. So that is our anti-discrimination policy. It prohibits discrimination based on a protected class um, as identified federally and by Vermont law, which has broader protections than the federal uh, requirements. And so um, our policy is stated below. I'm just taking a look there. You wanna give it a quick read.
So the discrimination definition is provided here and it explicitly is tied to a protected category. Um, so the behavior alleged must have been based on a protected class uh, status in order to find a violation. Um, and so I know there are instances where people feel as though they've been aggrieved um, and it's, there's been unfair treatment. Um, and sometimes they will describe that as discrimination. And so, although it may feel as though it is discrimination, in order for it to be discrimination according to the law, it needs to be based on a protected class. It just is an unfair treatment based on some other um, category that's outside the scope of um, the listed categories that are listed here. And so these are the federal and Vermont protected categories incorporated in policy 311. It includes um, everything um, that would be a protected category, but I just wanted to note in regard to sex that sex includes a protection and um, prohibition of discrimination based on gender, pregnancy, sexual orientation, as well as gender identity. And there are more inclusions, but those are the highlights I just Sometimes it's not really apparent that sex includes those other categories as well. Mm -hmm. So policy 311 does define sexual harassment um, and the sexual harassment that does not meet um, any standard that would fall into 311A, that is where this would be able to address some of that uh, behavior. So if the conduct is not severe, pervasive, and objectively uh, offensive, um, that is where policy 311 sexual harassment could come in to address behavior that's problematic or inappropriate and otherwise um, prohibited. Policy 311 also has a separate definition for harassment. And here what's addressed is inappropriate behavior based on any identified protected category um, that includes incidents that are verbal, written, visual, or physical, or any communication, for instance, which is very uh, common uh, nowadays, which are emails and social media. So the harassment that may be exhibited that way are also captured um, if it's you know, on any social media platform, that would be something that would be considered as well. So policy 311 uh, also includes uh, a prohibition on particular relationships. And so the official title of this policy is related on professional conduct, but it, basically it speaks to consensual relationships that are still prohibited, um, even though they're consensual. So it prohibits any uh, relationship between a student and employee where the employee is, or may be perceived to have power and authority over that student. And so here you'll find the link for support measures, uh, resources, policies, and the Title IX coordinators uh, contact information. So I'm going to pass it back over to Patty for Policy 316. Sure, although perhaps this might be a good place just to find out if there are any questions that are specific to Title IX, Policy 311A, or Policy 311, before we get into Policy 316. It's hard for me to see. So if, if um, with, with the screen up, it's hard to see. So if you have a, uh, if you are raising your hand, please let us know. Please speak out. Okay. So I'm gonna go forward, still time for questions at the end if you are if you were just trying to unmute yourself. Uh, so, the, oh, yes, sorry. So my question is uh, in terms of the reporting, because this is, this is training for trustees. I assume there's also training for staff and faculty. Uh, and my question is, is there an expectation of reporting if it comes to your awareness or is there a mandating of reporting if it comes to your awareness? 
there's a mandated, there's a requirement to report for staff and faculty, not for students. For so anyone affiliate, any um, non-student affiliated BSC individual is required to report. That and that that requirement, um, Bill, would be uh, the VSC requires it. Um, that is a you know, you know our policies require that our employees, our faculty, report if they have if if they have knowledge or have heard that there is. I think it's important to understand that that's the nature of the requirement. I think it's also important to make make clear that it's also the responsibility of trustees. So if a trustee becomes aware of something, and this came up in the Penn State case, and it this is really what generated the policy 316 and the requirement from um, our insurance company that we have policy 316 and we provide training to, to trustees, but um, it also applies to 311 and 311A. If a trustee is aware of a situation of harassment, sexual assault, abuse of a minor, um, it's an ob obligation of a trustee as well to report that to us so we can investigate it. Because if you're aware of it, we will be deemed, the Vermont State Colleges will be deemed to have notice of it. And then if we don't do anything, uh, then we are indifferent to it and we, we face legal liability. So part of the reason for doing the training is making sure that all the trustees understand that if they themselves are contacted by somebody about any of these kinds of behaviors that they know to reach back and report those. Um, and again, we have in the policies, there's a list of coordinators that it can be reported to, but you could always report it as well to, to the chancellor's office, to me, to Patty, to Catherine, but just make sure you report it so it gets addressed. Um, that's really critical. The earlier list of those who are reporting, if it's, you know, said, if it's a trustee reported to the, I think it was the chair of the board, uh, although I may be wrong, uh, et cetera. There, are, there were two obvious absences, uh, but given what we know is in the headlines right now, even those at the very top can sometimes be the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator. Yeah, back, back up one there. Uh, right. So, so, so that the, if it involves an employee, you report to the president or designee. So what this is talking about is who makes the final, uh, who makes the determination. So you can report the behavior to the Title IX coordinators or any individual who would be able to take the report. As Sophie mentioned, it could be um, general counsel, it could be me, it could be um, you know, a number of individuals throughout the campuses, Title IX coordinators, it could be the president of the university, it could be a number of individuals, but this particular slide speaks to who makes the determination after an investigation is completed. So this is who makes the ultimate um, finding. Do you have a slide further on that, that asks about if you become aware of a violation, report to it, yeah. I just went past it, yeah. Yeah. One of the following, yeah. So these are some of the places where you can report. Yeah, I just, I just want to be clear that even if it were to be at some point the chancellor who was the person that they were concerned about, or if it was the president themselves, uh, there was some place to report that. Absolutely. The, the other piece I would add to, and um, is we do have the whistleblower um, ethics point hotline as well. So that's always available as a as an opportunity to to report things, and this kind of conduct can be reported through that as well. You can either do it anonymously or you can do it uh, with your contact information. Um, and the whistleblower hotline information is available on the front page of the the VSC website. So that's another alternative of people. Um, I mean, obviously, as trustees, you kind of know who some of the senior leadership people are, you know who to reach out to. But if there's anyone that's that's watching this as a as the live stream, wouldn't know who to go to. Um, that's also an opportunity uh, that's available to them to report as well. Thank you. 
So we'll look at policy 316, uh, which uh, the VSC adopted uh, just a few years ago, maybe two years ago. It addresses obligations to prevent the abuse of minors. Um, we, as Sophie indicated, uh, over the last eight to 10 years, uh, there have been numerous um, incidents in the national uh, realm uh, where it appeared that perhaps some people knew something about something going on. And so the, um, this is a new, uh, this, this is a new policy, but it also interacts with 311 um, or, or 311A. So it, it really, um, it doesn't stand on its own completely. Uh, we, this is to, yep, so policy three, 316 requires that the, the trustees uh, report knowledge or suspected abuse of a minor. It does not need to be sexual abuse. It can be neglect or other abuse. Um, and it, you would report similar to the, the lines that we were discussing before, a policy 311A coordinator, general counsel, president, chancellor, chair of the board, um, director of human resources. So very similar in that sense, um, Bill, but it is, it is meant to, uh, it, the report needs to come to someone in, in a place where, where they, have, they have a role, we have a role to, to, to move it along according to our policy. If they have a reasonable suspicion of abuse, uh, that what does that mean? So it can mean that they witness something. Um, it can mean something that is told to them by a minor. Um, it can be what other adults are saying. There are, there are many combinations and the, um, the obligation is to, uh, if, if you're signaling something is wrong, then we would prefer you report it. Uh, and not be cautious, like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I should act on that. So we, we prefer that the re report happen. Uh, the, the, why do we have reports on minors? Well, as, as Sophie indicated, the, um, these other scandals have happened, but we do have minors present at um, our institutions as matriculated students. Uh, we have them as dual enrollment students. We have campers who come and do uh, special events at the at the different institutions. So we do impact, we do have interactions with minors. Um, and many um, we want to ensure that our institutional leaders are informed if there is an allegation, if something happens, we do not want the institutional leaders to be uninformed. Uh, the the Vermont uh, Vermont has a law on mandating reporting. Um, and that is, uh, Vermont law specifically identifies mandated reporters. There's a pretty lengthy list of who is a mandated reporter. It includes, say, nurses or uh, K through 12 teachers, um, uh, physicians. Um, so some of the individuals who uh, work on our campuses might be considered mandated reporters. But VSC has expanded that to uh, anybody who does have knowledge or suspect suspicion, a reasonable suspicion of abuse. So we do not want to limit the VSC's obligation to report to the same uh, categories that are identified at, through the state mandation. We want, we want to expand that. So we, um, uh, all VSC employees, and our trustees as well are, are, reported, are required to report according to the VSC policy. Um, if they're a mandated reporter, they must also make a report according to law. And most of the times those individuals uh, are professionals and that is part of their professional conduct. So they know, uh, they know how to make that report. And, um, and we, yeah, so we're gonna have it right here though, that you would call the, um, you call this number. And if you, and that is if you suspect that there's a problem. If you think there's an immediate danger to a child, then don't wait, call 911, call local law enforcement. Uh, you still would have to report um, to the family services uh, within 24 hours, if indeed 
uh, you, even though you make a 911 call. I think finally, it, the reason, you know, so policy 316 came upon us in part because uh, the issues that were happening um, in the country brought to the forefront the need to have uh, mandated reporting. And then that caused the VSC to also uh, look further at our own policies and provide a specific policy to stop child abuse. Uh, once again, I do wanna warn that we don't believe that trustees uh, or, or other members of the VSC community should do their own investigation because uh, of the potential to interfere or somehow harm uh, the investigation itself. So the investigators will, um, the investigation will be done by professionals, but we have an obligation to report. I should note that uh, policy 316 is also contained in on the Resolve website, which is where our 311 and 311A policies and information is on. Is on. So that is a great place to look further at this, uh, at, at, at our policy. Um, and I guess that's that's the end of, of our presentation, but we'd like to open up the floor to questions. Are there any questions? Bill? Go ahead. Uh, again, so this is training for us as trustees, but it also encompasses training. I mean, these are things which are which don't apply to just us as trustees, but apply to all BSC employees and students. Just to be clear, if, if, a, if a student is an employee, no, but I mean, if they're not, I mean, it applies equally to students who are aware. I guess it's it's hard for me to keep track of who's what level applies where, but is this these are mandated? These are required reporting requirements for students as well as employees. In terms of reporting something which they believe is in violation of these policies, I don't believe that that policy three sixteen would extend to students in the set if they are not an employee. Um, I, I think that would be difficult to uh, difficult to enforce. I, so I, I should read it specifically, but I don't believe I have it right here. Well it does employ to it does it does. It applies to students as well. Yes. So mm -hmm. apologize for that. So are students made aware of this? Students have so I'm, th so I'm, I'm thinking of instances where, you know, we've heard egregious instances of uh, hazing, which in fact sometimes uh, has been uh, physically hurtful, sexually hurtful. Uh, and some, you know, you become aware of it and you're like, I, just, I'm not, I don't want to deal with that. It is my understanding that, that, that students are, are trained on all three of these policies um, at the beginning of each, uh, each year. That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you to both of the councils for going through that. That was helpful. If we have any more questions on this, feel free to let the administration know and, let the, and we can review the, the information again. Uh, we now are at an executive session. Um, Megan, do you wanna read the motion to go into executive session, please? I can. Um, I move the board of trustees enter into executive session, session pursuant to 1 VSA 331 A1B to discuss labor relations agreements with employees, 1 VSA 313 A1E to discuss pending litigation, 
and 1 BSA 313A1F for the purpose of receiving confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services. Because premature general public knowledge of these discussions would place the VSC at a substantial disadvantage, no formal or binding action shall be taken in executive session. Along with the members of the board present in the meeting, in its discretion, the board invites the chancellor and the general counsel to attend. And the assistant counsel, assistant general counsel. And the assistant general counsel. I, I don't think, I don't think Catherine needs to, to join given what we're covering. I think it's just Patty and I <laughs> will give Catherine the rest of the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, um, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a, a second for that? Second. Karen, Karen seconds it. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of going to executive session for these reasons, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. okay, everybody looks like we're all set. Okay, we're going to go into the uh, breakout room. Thank you, everybody else, for being here. We'll be out shortly, we hope. Okay, can everyone hear me now? We are out of executive session at 4.30, and we are trying to vote on some resolutions and some motions. Can we share the resolution, Patty? Okay, this is a resolution. Do you want to go over, Patty, real quick so we can have a, res a, a motion? Okay, this is resolution 2021-021. It's an authorizing settlement related to EBS licenses. Uh, resolved the pursuant to VSC policy 426, the board authorizes Vermont State Colleges to enter into a settlement agreement by which Utopian Wireless Corporation shall publicly market and sell the EBS licenses and divide the proceeds of such sale pursuant to the terms. Settlement agreement with Utopian be a further resolved, the chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges or their designees hereby authorized to negotiate terms and conditions consistent with the foregoing for the transfer of one or both properties. I need a motion on that. I'll move that. Okay, Sean Tester. I'm second. That. Second. 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 Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any questions or any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion and the resolution, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you, Patty. And we also have a motion to accept the contract negotiated for the, do we indicate which ones? The NDU online faculty? You're, you're, you're muted, Patty. Sorry, NDU online unit. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have, would someone like to make a motion to accept the uh, Collective bargain agreement with the NVU online faculty. Sure. Jim. Jim Maslin moves. A second. Second. Second from Sue. Uh, any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of, of uh, accepting that negotiation, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> okay, thank you. And the last one is a collective bargain agreement with the the Vermont State College Staff Federation. Um, we have a motion to accept that negotiation agreement. Sure, Jim. Second by Jim. Okay, we have got those that motion on the table. Um, any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No opposition, okay. Um, those have both passed. Now, we are finished with our agenda and uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Ryan, so moved. Who is the second? Maslin's the second. 
<laughs> Any discussion or questions? I'd hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seeing that all those in approval, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I think we're all done. <laughs> See you. See you later. Thank you Thank all. Bye-bye. Thank you.